I am so absolutely thrilled to introduce to you two people that probably 10 minutes ago you probably had never met. These are two new friends of mine who are from Nigeria. And I've, since the moment I heard about them from my dear friend, Pastor Len Harper, who pastors a uh, church down on Bell Shoals, um, he told me about the story that you're going to hear. And I got to hear it from these two this morning. It's a powerful story. And it's probably like you've never experienced in your life, but we serve the same God and we work in the same kingdom. But let me tell you, this day, this day is about victory in Jesus. And you're going to hear a story from my two friends, honored guests and, and pastors, pastors in a community that was completely and utterly pastorless, Christianless. So I'm, I'm going to ask that Wilson and Praise, would you come forward? Pastor Wilson, Pastor Praise, come forward. Hello, my brother. Welcome. My sister, may the Lord bless you and may our ears be open to your message. Thank you so much, sir. I want to first of all thank my beloved reverend, Dr. David, for receiving us into the church. Because if he have not opened the door, we'll not be able to come in. So I want to thank you very much, sir. God bless you, sir. I want to thank the leadership of this great ministry also. Uh, the, the elders, the board of elders, the board of deacons, for standing behind such a man of God. Uh, just as he heard of me from Pastor Lynn Upper, Pastor Lynn Upper also told me of him that I have a good friend in the town. Uh, I did not heard of him just now. I heard of him two years ago that I have a good friend. Uh, I will talk to my friend one day if you can get to his church. Two years ago, is it two or more than two years? Almost three years ago that I have a good friend. <laughs> so I thank the leadership and I thank every member of this great church for receiving us. May the God of heaven bless you in Jesus' name. Uh, my names are Wilson Okotie. And here is my beloved wife, Praise Okotie. We have five children. We have married now for 19 years. And we have five. The first child is, uh, is presently in college. Is by name Dominion. The second child he is Miracle. That's their boys. Then the third child, a girl, her name is Light. The fourth one, name is Fruitful. That's a girl. Then the last one, I believe we will not have another one. <laughs> the last one, <laughs> uh, which is the little baby, he is a young boy, is by name Multiplier. Uh, God has actually multiplied us. <laughs> Amen. I am so grateful. Uh, first of all, before I do anything, probably my wife may want to say something. She always loves singing. She, she, she loves dancing and singing. So probably she may just love to give one special number and let me be your, your backup master. So any song you want to sing, go ahead. I need you, Lord, I need you.
continue, uh, I will want to show you a uh, three minutes video clip. Now, the video I want to show to you is a video of the conversion of the king of the kingdom I want to speak of to you. This king, when I first got to the kingdom where he rules, he Ordered that men should arrest me, and he ordered that they I should be tied to the tree in the forest. That was 1994. But 2002, God visited him, and he became born again after I preached to him. Today is a born again. Christian, I want you to see that alongside with the first elementary school that we establish in that old kingdom of over a million people. Please, can you just play the video for me? Is that Pastor John? Yes. <laughs> Hello, John. <laughs> Thank you. God bless you. I receive him 
into my life. Into my life. Into my body. Into my body. Give me greater power. Give me greater power. Move inside me. Move inside me. Amen. Thank you so much. Now, shall we pray? Shall we pray? Spirit of the living God that dwells within us, we bow our souls before your sovereignty. I ask you as I share the testimony of what Jesus did among the Ebema Ijo people group in Nigeria. I want you to use the testimony to induce faith into the heart of your people. I pray that you strengthen everyone, you energize everyone here, and bring blessing to everyone here. This I ask in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In Nigeria, when a preacher says, praise the Lord, the congregation will respond by saying, hallelujah. So if I say, praise the Lord, you are going to say, hallelujah with me because I'm about to take you down to Nigeria. So praise the Lord. Hallelujah. No, let's do it one more time. I want it to be very loud. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, you are presently in Nigeria. <laughs> By the grace and the mercy of God, the spirit of the living God, the Almighty, sent me to a people group called the Egbema Ijo Kingdom. The Egbema Ijo Kingdom, they are the Ijo people dwelling along the river, the, the River Bank of Southern Nigeria. They are approximately around one million plus, more than a million in population in that kingdom of Ebema. They have up to 100 communities in that kingdom alone. Probably some years back, you would have heard of some Ijo militants in Niger Delta of Nigeria. They are the people. They are the Ijo militants that usually go down to oil companies and kidnap the foreigners, the oil foreigners, the oil company foreigners, to get some ransom from them. They are the people. If you have heard about it before, they are the people. So God sent me to this people group. God sent me there with a vision, which I'm going to share another time if I have the opportunity to come here, if God gives me the opportunity to do so. But when I first get in, got into this kingdom, there was not one existing church in the kingdom of over one million people. Not one church. Number two, there is no school. In that whole kingdom of hundred communities. Number three, as I'm talking to you now, there is no clinic, no hospital in that place. And yet, that is the area 
the oil companies are getting their crude oil from. The government, they are not ready to develop the area. The oil companies are not ready because the oil company have to pay money to the government. The government, which is being controlled mostly by the Muslims in the northern part of Nigeria. They don't want the Ijos to gain education because if they gain education, they are going to rise up and begin to demand for resource control. So they put them, put them in the cage. They don't want them to come up. So God sent me to this people group. Up to today, somebody will be sick of malaria fever, typhoid fever. You have diarrhea and they die of diarrhea. Children die all the time. Pregnant women, if you see the way women give birth to children, it's so horrible. Some of them, they, they need to, to, to grant, to, to pound, uh, do you know, okra? We, we call it okra there, but maybe you call it okra. Yeah, they, they, I think they sell it. It's a vegetable, yeah? They, uh -huh. they have to pound it and mix it with water and pour it in the pri private part of a woman that is about to give birth so that there will be free movement of the child. And most children come out and, and become dead. So it's not easy. A lot of women, young girls are dying. God sent me to these people. Not just to preach the gospel, but to change the culture. To change the whole kingdom. When God sent me there, I started preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. For three good months, nobody responded to my gospel there was a very strong resistance from the people. And I got discouraged. I thought God did not send me. Uh, can I go to a place three months? No sponsor? Nobody sponsoring me. I just went there. I was very fortunate that I have not married at that time. So I have no wife. I have no children. I'm just moving alone. So I was very lucky. Because if I have wife and children, I don't think they will be able to endure that pain with me. But I was there. After the three months, I started wondering, why is it that these people are not responding to the gospel? One day, I started reading my Bible, and I read the book of Second Corinthians. Chapter 4, verse 3 and verse 4. In verse 3, Paul said, if the gospel is hidden, maybe your Bible may say hide. If, your, if the gospel is hidden, it is hidden from those that are lost. Verse 4 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 now says, In whom the God of this earth has blinded their mind so that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ will not shine. In their heart, in their mind. When I read those two verses, immediately I understood why the people are not responding to my gospel. Remember, this is the first church that is about to break the ground. It's not like America where you already have Christians everywhere. We are talking of a place where there is no Christian. And you're about to break the ground. If there are any Christians, they are in the city. Amen. So, I started praying after reading this scripture. 
that, okay, I can understand. The reason the people are not responding is because the prince of the power of the air, according to Ephesians chapter 2, that walketh in the art of the children of disobedient, that demonic prince is the one hindering the people from receiving the gospel of Christ from me. So a question now come in. What will I do to solve this problem? So I started searching the scripture. And I read the book of Matthew, chapter 12, verse 29. Jesus said, if you get to a strong man's house, the first thing you are expected to do is to bind the strong man. Then the second thing, you spoil his goods. So I said, yes, I've got the answer to this issue. So now I started praying against the demonic gods that the people worship in that land. According to the people in the land, they call that demonic gods Igbesu. It's a spirit being that they worship there. And that spirit is the territorial spirit that controls the place. So I started praying against that power. I started making a declaration in the name of Jesus. You territorial spirit. I command you to lose your grip from the life of the people. I break every chain. As I started praying, I prayed and prayed. Maybe you don't understand what I'm saying. Because if you can find yourself in such place and see people actually worshiping devil, then you will understand what I mean. But I want you to know this, that if you don't believe that in every land there is territorial spirit that control the land, there is a big error. Because all through the Bible, you see it there. In the book of Daniel, when Daniel was in the, in the land of Pesha, he prayed for the release of the Israelites from the land of Pesha. But something happened. God sent an angel to bring the answer. The prince of Pesha, it was a demonic prince, a demon, withhold that angel from bringing the answer. Unfortunately for Daniel, Jesus had not come, get to the head to share his blood. So Daniel don't have the blood of Jesus to use against the devil. So he was just there praying, crying to God. So God has to send another angel. That is to tell you that there are territorial spirits that control every land. Now, probably you will say that is the time of Daniel. This is the New Testament. Yes, Apostle Paul who planted so many churches for Jesus Christ, the devil hindered him. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18, Apostle Paul wanted to go and visit the Thessalonian Christians. But he said, once and again, we want to come to you. But Satan, Hinder us. Satan hinder Apostle Paul. If Satan can hinder Apostle Paul, then who are you? If Satan can hinder him, a man who got deeper revelation of God, planned a lot of churches. So that is to reveal to us that there are territorial spirits. So I started praying against that power for one month. At the end of one month, I took my Bible and I went out to preach to people. 
Believing in my heart that yes, I've done the right thing. Yes, I'm right. And I went out and I started preaching to people. Do you know that nobody still respond to me? Not one soul got born again. And I became more discouraged. I started looking at the Bible. Is, is these promises, are they real? Uh, are these, the scripture true? I don't know if you have come to a point where you sit down and say, but God promised me. You have used the promise to pray. God promised, you quote the scripture, you quote it. But you don't sit down and say, what, what is happening? It's not happening. I don't know if, if such thing have happened to you because it have happened to me. And I got discouraged. But I thank God that God is always by his people. Then I went ahead and began to do some research from the Bible. What is the issue? I have prayed the normal kind of prayer. I have prayed against the demonic forces. Not one soul is responding. So what is missing? As I started reading and I read the book of Matthew chapter 17, I read the story of a young child possessed with a demon. And the father of that child brought the child to the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. And I believe that 12 of them form cycle around. That's my own imagination there. 12 of them form cycle and begin to pray. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. They shouted, come on, come on, come on. The demon refused to leave. When the father of that child was tired of the whole thing, the father asked them a question. Can I see your master? And they said, okay, let's go. And they took the father and that child to Jesus. And Jesus just looked at the child and said, you demon, get out. And the demon left the child. The 12 apostles, they were amazed. Then in the private, they went to Jesus to ask him one question. Why is it that we were unable to cast out this devil? Why? And Jesus said something that if we don't look at it critically, we will think that Peter don't have faith. Jesus now told the 12 guys that because of your own belief. When Jesus said because of your own belief. Now I want you to think about this. Peter, a man who left his fishing business. He left his hedge father. He left his wife and children. And followed Jesus. Only for Jesus to turn to him and said, you don't have faith. Let me tell you the truth. That guy have faith. A man who left his wife and children and business and his father, that guy have faith. Because if he do not have faith, he cannot do that. He believed in Jesus. That's why he followed but what did Jesus meant by that statement? I don't want to go to all those talk there, all those theory there. But I want to tell you what I did. In verse 21 of Matthew chapter 17, Jesus now brought something out to explain what he meant when he said that because of your own belief, what was the thing? In verse 21, Jesus said, This kind cannot go except by prayer and fasting. That is the key. I want you to turn to somebody close to you and say to this person, This problem cannot go Except by prayer and fasting. Do you know you have prayed for something? You pray again and again and again and again and again. 
God is saying, this kind cannot go except by prayer and fasting. So say this to the next person to you. Say it with me. This kind cannot go except by prayer and fasting. You don't bribe God with fasting. You don't bribe him. Fasting is like you saying, I want to wait on the Lord. I Let me pull off myself from everything. Let me just go to my closest and just stay with, with my father. And you completely forgot that you need to eat. You don't even remember that you need to eat. You say, I'm not going to leave this place. I'm going to sit down here, wait for my father. Because the scriptures say, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So I will not leave here. I will not eat. I will not do anything until my father visit me. That is fasting. Not that you are there, say, yes, I'm fasting so that God will visit. No, 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 no. You don't bribe him with that. You, you are only trying to say, oh, Lord, I humble myself before you. I, then it's like you say, I have no power of my own. I have no power of my own. I confess to you, Holy Spirit of God, I have no power of my own. That is the meaning of fasting. I have no strength of mine, Lord. I cannot do it. I need you. I need you. That's why my wife loves singing this song. I need you. Lord, I need you every hour. I need you. Bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. It's only those that says, Lord, I cannot do it. They are the people that God wants to help. And that is the reason of fasting. So when I involve in fasting, crying to God, Father, my strength has produced nothing. I have tried my wisdom. My wisdom cannot produce any result. Lord, I give up. I bow before you. Father, do it yourself. And suddenly, after some days of fasting, a burden came into my heart, a thought, very strong thought, came into my heart and says, now go out. This is the time to go. And I went out. As I went out, it was the Holy Spirit that was actually leading me at that time. When I went out, the first two young men I met, which I preached to, I just told them about Jesus Christ. Before I ran up the story of who is Jesus, they immediately gave their life to Christ and they get born again. Today, as I'm talking to you now, today they are pastors in our ministry. And that was the beginning of the planting of the first church. So the church, people started coming. And the church started to grow. Grow to a point that I now felt that I have people now that can pray with me. I'm not the only one to pray for the kingdom again. We are very many now. So I started teaching them the principle that I discovered from the Bible, that let us fast and pray against the territorial spirit. Deal with the power. So when I taught them, then I mobilized them. We started praying together. Praying against the demonic gods, which they call Igbisu in the land. As we start to pray about that demonic gods, the demon 
stir up the heart of the king. The king which you saw, he stir up his heart against me. And the king sent some young men to arrest me. And they took me to his palace. And he sat, he sat me down and said, you foolish preacher. You get to this community to speak against the gods of the land? Who are you for you to do that? For that reason, he said, they should take me down to the forest and tie me to the tree. And they took me down and tied me to the tree. And the young men that tied me there, they left. When they left, I will tell you, I'm a human being. <laughs> My real flesh came. I just realized that, ah, I'm about to die. So I started saying, ah, is this, is this the gospel? Is this the calling of God? To tie me on the tree? To die? So I started crying in the forest alone. I was crying and crying and saying, God, ah. I started uh, a kind of pity to myself. Why, 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 do I, why do I come to such a place? Why do I respond to the voice of God and come to this place? Then, as I was doing that crying, a thought just came into me and said to me that if you cry, this young man will come and they are going to kill you. If you stop crying and begin to claim the kingdom for Jesus Christ, they will still come and kill you. So why not stop crying and start to claim the kingdom and declare what you want to see in the land? As that thought came into me, I believe it was the Holy Spirit that just put that thought in me. And immediately I stopped crying. And I changed my crying to declaration. I start to, to declare the word of God. I start to declare and begin to say in the name of Jesus. I claim this kingdom for Jesus. I claim the king for Jesus. The men, the women, the boys, the girls. I claim them for Jesus in the name of Jesus. And I begin to declare, I shall not die, but I shall live to declare the glory of God in this land. As I started declaring that. As I started declaring that, something jumped into me and that was faith. My faith rise. I became bold, despite that they tied me to the tree. I became very bold there. I began to say, yes, I will not die. I will not die. I will live. I will declare the glory of God in this land. After some hours, I saw four young men. They came back. So when they came, I thought they wanted to come and kill me. So I just closed my eyes and began to say, I will not die. I will not die. And they came and they loosed the rope from me. They took me down to the king's palace. And the king said, you can follow this chief down to his house. So I don't understood why the king just said, you can just go follow this chief. It was later. I was told that when I was in the bush praying that prayer, crying and praying, the Holy Spirit moved into the king's palace and there was confusion among the chiefs. Some of the chiefs begin to say, let's get him out of the community from the kingdom. Some say, no, let us kill him. Some say, he's a spy. So there was confusion among them. But finally, one of the chiefs that took me to his house stood up and said that, no one have the legal right to send this young preacher out of this community because he prayed for me so that my children will no longer be dying because every year the man will lose four or five children. Every year. For that reason, he married 14 wives. 
You see, the culture, the culture that permit marrying of many wives. <laughs> so he married 14 wives so that they can be producing children every year. So if you lose three, well, the more, more, five may come in. So that is how, he, he, that was the reason he, he, he had those 14 wives. So when I pray for the first time, God intervened and there was no death of a child. For that reason, the man, the chief stood up and said, I adopt this young man, this young preacher to become my son. No one have the right to send my son out of the community. That was how God preserved me in that kingdom. In fact, that chief was the brain behind me marrying to my wife. Because my wife, she is a princess in the kingdom. The granddaughter of the late king before this very king. That chief was a brain behind it. And after I got married to my wife, this very king not decide to receive me. Though he worship that demonic God, he said, well, since you have been received by my people, I have no option but to receive you. So, and you have married to a princess in the land. So, Ina said, I give you land to build your church in all the communities. The hundred communities. As I'm, as I'm talking to you now, every community donated five acres of land to me to put church. The 100 communities. Anywhere I go there, I, can, I don't need to buy, I, I don't pay for land. It's free. Because the king said, I give you free land because I marry to a princess from the land. And that was how we started. A place without one church. Today, we have 16 churches in that kingdom. Not only that, because of the revelation that God gave to me in 1993 before I went there, which I'm going to share with you next time if I have the opportunity, if God gives me the opportunity to come here, I will share it. The revelation that God gave to me is to get few men into my house and train them. So I started training young men. In that community, like what I said, there is no single school, not one school in that community. So it takes me three years just to teach how to read and write before I start to preach Bible. I have to teach people how to read. It came to a point I have to write a book on how to read and write English. So, I took young men to my house and trained them. When I trained them, maybe three or four at a time. I don't take more than four. Three at a time. When I got married to my wife, we bring three young men to stay with us. My wife will be cooking for them. They will stay with us one year, two years. Let them wash. They wash my relationship with my wife. And how I relate with my children. They serve me in the house. They wash clothing. They, they clean the house. Then I say, now you have learned by practical. Now go, let us go to the next community and put a church there. Now go and be the pastor there. That is how we planted those churches. And since that time till this time, our 32 young men that get converted through the grace of God in my life 
they are ministers of the gospel today. Some of them are now general overseer of their own ministry. Why some are with me in that kingdom, trying to reach the kingdom. And because there was no school, I brought that vision for the first time. If you see, you will notice that there's one white guy in the video that followed me down there. His name is Nick Chaplin from the state, from Clearwater. When I came, he said, I want to see that place. And he came there and he saw that over one million people, not one school, he stood up and said, what shall we do? I said, well, we need teachers. So he said, okay, I am going. Can you bring some of the pastor's wives? Let us send them to school to gain education. He said, I am going to sponsor that. So he sponsored the education. He included my wife. Today, my wife, she is a qualified teacher. My wife was sent by Faith Christian Church to the college to gain education, to become a teacher. And some other pastor's wives were trained to become teachers. That was how we were able to establish that school. Because... Now, when we started, the second challenge is finance to pay the teachers. And Nick Chaplin came back to the state because he's a good friend to Lane Harper, Pastor Lane Harper, because he's a good friend. He shared with him, and Pastor Lane Harper said, wow, that is great. If that is the issue, I want to pay the salary of those pastors, uh, of those teachers. So, Sad Branda Worship Center today, they pay the salary of those teachers so that the, the school can keep on existing. Because the financial ability to sustain the school right there is not there. So, that is what I am trusting the Lord. Now, we decided that we need to establish a school in the closest city to those villages so that when we now have students from, from the city to get to that school, they will pay tuition fee. When they pay tuition fee, with that money, we cannot pay the teachers in that school in the city and also pay those teachers in the villages so that I don't need to depend on United States to survive the school any longer. And I share with Nick, uh, Nick and Lynn Appa, and they said, Lynn said, yes, you are right, because I cannot keep on paying the, teach the teachers for the next 50 years. It's not possible. I can only do my best to a point. But if you come up with this plan, I think this is a good plan. So that schools can continue there. All I need to say to you, if you can partner with me in this vision, I would say to you, there is a reward awaiting you. It is the vision of God is not my vision. I never intended to go to such kingdom, but God sent me there and hoping the door of United States because he knows that there are people he have prepared here in the state to partner with me for that work. And I'm trusting God that you are part of the partner to that work right there. Shall we stand up? Let me pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. I want to connect with you because I love when our beloved Reverend Dr. David was talking about connecting to the heart. And for that to happen to me, I felt we should stretch our hands. So I want you to stretch your hands towards me as I stretch my hands towards you. We are connecting together. We are touching each other in the spirit. And let me pray for you. Sovereign Father, 
the God that made an everlasting covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I ask you this afternoon to stretch your hands of grace, your hands of love upon everyone here. I decree in the name of Jesus that every spiritual dark cloud over any family that is represented here today, let the cloud be torn to pieces. I remove that dark cloud in the name of Jesus. I pray for children, those that have gone out of home, that they will return back to their parents. I pray for those that are wounded in their heart, that God Almighty heal those wounded heart. In the name of Jesus, I bless you today. I decree those of victory and opportunity before you. In the name of Jesus, it is well with you. It is well with your family. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord today, yes? If you would like prayer, if you would like prayer, uh, Pastor Wilson has said, I, I would really like to pray over folks in South Bay. He'll have a special word for you, a time of ministry for you. So as we're dismissing, if you would like to come forward and, and have him pray over you, I encourage you to come. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your power and your love. God, today has been about victory, and we thank you for victory. Victory in Jesus Christ. Father, what a remarkable story. What a great couple of faith. Bless their ministry, Father, I pray. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here today.